Um, hey everyone, uh, it, it's Shannon Shu here. I'm so glad, glad that you all are joining. Um, folks are going to be joining us kind of um, as we, we just opened the room up. Um, and I'm excited to do this. Uh, we've got a lot of, ex um, a lot of folks that have already pre-given me questions. So, um, but I'm, yeah. Um, so I, I'm sure we are going to have a very lively conversation. So this topic today is about how to set up a trust, why to set up a trust, or how to take your trust and if you want to revise it. So we got a couple different things that we're going to cover today. Um, you are meeting, I'm going to introduce Natasha, who, who is fabulous. Um, Natasha Carroll Ferry is also my trust attorney, and she has done a phenomenal job with me. Um, I had it with a different attorney before, so she has revised mine. Um, and I, I, I think that it's been it's important to have a trust regardless of your age. Um, we are going to leave a lot of time at the end for Q and A um, because I think that that what Natasha will cover is going to bring up things like, oh, I wonder if I can ask her like I have a very specific question or I have something related to what you you're thinking. So I want to be able to give that, give you guys that space. And then if you guys don't have too many questions, I will pepper her with questions that some of you have given me in advance or have said, this is something I've been thinking about. And I'm going to go ahead and just present that to Natasha. So you can, you don't have, you can remain anonymous. Um, so uh, without further ado, Natasha is um, a California trust attorney and probate attorney. She will go through uh, what that means, um, and specifically what she does. And I asked her to give us good real world examples um, so that it's not all like legal speak, but in all actuality, it's just very like um, easy to grasp examples of what a trust helps us with. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, let Natasha take the floor. Um, thank you for having me, Shannon. It's really nice to, to meet all of you, although, although lots of black screens. Um, and um, I am looking forward to um, answering your questions when, however they come, whether through Shannon or I don't know if you're gonna do questions through chat, if you'll do that, that's cool with me. Um, but um, what I kind of wanted to do is sort of give, go over kind of the overview of like what this is all about um, and, um, and kind of step back from the very beginning. So some of this is, it, maybe you've heard it before, but I feel like a lot of times it's really helpful to start at the beginning and then kind of work our way into the more kind of complicated situation. Um, so basically um, what we're talking about in terms of trusts and real estate and things like that, it, um, when we're talking about trusts, we're talking about um, estate planning. And what estate planning is really all about is making sure that you have a plan in place for at the time that you are either incapacitated or at the time that you die and making sure that your stuff gets to the people who you want it to get to. So in California, every state has their own laws about this. In California, um, the, the name of the game is really to avoid probate. Um, people know the term probate, they don't know what it is. So probate is really just the name of the court. So you've heard of criminal court, you've heard of family court, um, the probate court is just another court. Um, and what probate kind of comes up at two particular times um, when somebody, in somebody's world. Um, the first is, if there's ever a time where someone is incapacitated, um, so if somebody's in a car accident um, and they um, lost consciousness, or they're going into surgery and they're under, under anesthesia, um, those are two examples where you might lose consciousness, you are not available to make decisions for yourself. Um, so if you have not done any planning in advance, then your loved one goes to probate court to get the right to be able to make financial or medical decisions on your behalf. So that is how they do that. They go to probate court, they file a petition and all that stuff. Um, one of the ways around that is by uh, creating a financial power of attorney and a healthcare power of attorney. And so, and I'll get into how the trust plays into that too, but those two documents are really key to making sure that if there's ever a period of incapacity, then you've got your stuff handled, um, both your medical side of things and the financial side of things. Um, so that's, that becomes important. And your successor trustee then in a trust would also kind of fall in line with that as well in a period of incapacity. Um, this is actually true for married couples as well. So just by being married, you do not have the legal right to make decisions um, for your spouse in terms of healthcare or finances. So that is a misconception that people often have. 
Um, so the second time that, that is kind of the crux of where this falls in is um, probate comes up when somebody dies. And if you only have a will or you don't have a will, then all of your estate, so everything that you own, goes into probate court. And probate court at that point in time is tasked with doing um, basically three things. So they are figuring out what assets you have, they're figuring out what debts you have, and then transferring your assets into the name of somebody who is alive. Um, and the reason why in California we don't like going through probate is because it takes 18 to 24 months before anything is completed, which is absurd. Um, the, uh, it is a public proceeding. And the third thing is really the cost. So the cost of probate is a percentage of gross assets. So when you're talking about real estate, for example, you're talking about the value of the house, not how much of the mortgage you owe. Um, it, I don't care about the mortgage when we're talking about probate fees. And in California, um, you know, most real estate, most is going to bring you up to a, um, a total estate value of around a million dollars. So for an estate of a million dollars, the probate fee is $23,000 for the executor and $23,000 for the attorney that they hire. So sometimes the executor is a loved one who declines the fee, but an attorney is never going to decline the fee. So if you've got a million dollars in gross assets, then you've got $23,000. And it's a percentage again. So if you've got um, you know, $500,000 in gross assets, then the fee ends up being $13,000 for the executor and $13,000 for the attorney. Um, you know, and then it sort of, so it, it is a percentage. It grow, it's, I can give you the formula, but it is not worth getting into. So the idea then is how do we avoid all of this, right? And one of the ways to avoid it is by setting up a trust. So this is a really like, it's a very legal concept, but a trust, I try to think of it, if you had to like visualize it, it's kind of like having a treasure box. So you have this treasure box and you set it up during your lifetime. And what you do with your trust is you put all your stuff in the treasure box. So you put your house in the treasure box, you put your bank accounts in the treasure box, you do all this stuff and get it all into this treasure box. And then what you've done is um, you, you in your trust designate who's going to get everything at the time that you die. And by the time, by you doing this, you take probate's job away from it. You've already put it in this box. The box is gonna go and, you know, wherever you want it to go. The other thing that a trust allows you to do then is once your assets are in this trust, you're, um, you are the initial trustee. So you control everything when you set one up. Um, but then you have a successor trustee who can kick in when you're incapacitated and manage all of these finances for you, measure your, uh, manage, excuse me, your treasure box for you so that you get to pay all of your taxes um, on time. You can file the extension. You can, you know, invest as needs to be invested or sell if you need to sell. And all of these things then can be managed through having this living trust. Um, the trust is kind of cool because the trust uses your social security number. It's the same, um, it, you file taxes the same way. You basically do all of these things as you usually do, um, but it does get you out of probate. So you save yourself those probate fees. A couple of misconceptions about trusts are that they um, help you some kind of how avoid taxes or avoid liability if somebody sues you or anything like that. That is not the case with a living trust. A living trust, the sole job of this trust is to get you out of probate. Um, that is, it doesn't protect your assets. It doesn't shield anything from any taxes because it is interchangeable with you. It is your, it's your social security number that's being used. However, there are strategies that you can use when setting up the trust. If, for example, you are a married couple setting up a trust, you might set it up in such a way so that assets are split at the time the first spouse dies. There's other strategies that you can employ in terms of that. Um, the, the real world examples that I wanted to kind of touch on that Shannon sort of talked about, I feel like the biggest thing for me is that a lot of times when people set up trusts, they um, think they're done. Um, so they sign all the paperwork and they do their thing. Sometimes they, my hope is that they've hired an attorney. Um, if they have tried to do it on their own, that's troubling and that's, we'll, we'll get to revising them in a second. But um, so um I right now am handling a probate in which the person who passed away had a trust, um, but she didn't put her house in the trust. 
And so now we have to probate her house. So now we have to go through the whole process of probate. We have to file everything. It's going to take a year, a, a year and a half before this is all resolved. There is only one kid. There's no disputes. Nobody is arguing about what's happening. There's nothing other than the legal process that is going to slow this down. And by having to go through probate now, the, um, the, the child of the person who died um, is now also going to have to pay these fees. Um, and so um, that is, it's really, you know, unfortunate because she did, she thought she did this. She thought she was saving this, you know, step and helping everybody kind of manage everything um, and be able to avoid the probate process. And that just didn't happen because she didn't know. And that is an example of somebody who did it herself. Um, the other thing that in California, one of the things that we um, can do, and this is not true in other states, but um, if you work with an attorney, most attorneys will ask you to list your assets in some form. Um, and usually what that is, is because if you forget to put one of your assets that is listed um, as um, like a schedule, like a, an addendum to the, to the trust, um, then, then the attorney or an attorney can file a petition with probate court to put it into the trust. So, for example, I had another client who contacted me who um, they were administering the trust for a family friend who died, um, owned a house in Orange County, and um, it wasn't disputed what was going to happen with the house, but it, he didn't put the house in the trust because he had used LegalZoom um, or one of the other legal, I, I'm fairly certain it was legal Zoom, but I don't want to speak badly about online providers without knowing exactly. So um, so we had, we filed this petition with the court. Um, no one, all of the heirs agreed to this. Um, and it took about, um, I want to say it was around eight, eight or nine months before the court approved it to put the house in the trust so that it could be there. In this case, we were lucky because he had listed his house as one of his assets. So we could do this and get it into the trust that way. In the case that I told you about the first time, they didn't even have that list. So there was no way we can get that house into the trust. We have to go through the full probate. So in both instances, by not putting the house in the trust, we have this kind of awful delay. Um, so that is, those are kind of the, the two sides of make sure that you get your house in the trust because the value of your house then goes through probate and then you're talking about time and fees and there's just no reason for it. Um, so that's kind of like my, my overview of, of trusts. Um, and so let me, let me touch then on the, if you already have a trust and you want to redo something in your trust, um, usually what can happen, so most attorneys um, will not amend or change a trust that already exists. But let me hold that with a caveat. Um, what we will not do is change parts of the trust. So if you have a trust and you say, hey, I just want to change this one thing that's really bothering me. I really want to make sure that um, my kid gets everything. Instead of saying 25, I really want to change it to 35. Like, can we just do that? Um, the answer you're going to get from most attorneys, unless they drafted it, is well, not exactly. What we would do is what's called a restatement, which basically keeps the name of the trust the same and then changes everything that's in the trust. So at that point, you are basically redoing a whole new trust, but you are um, keeping the name and the date of the trust the same. So if you have done as I instructed and put all of your assets into the trust, so then you don't have to redo that. So it becomes a little bit easier in terms of making sure then, yes, you can change it from 25 to 35. You could also change who your trustees are. Also, as part of that, usually a new attorney then will have you do, um, well, they will all, everybody will have you do a new will, um, but everybody, usually an attorney would also have you redo a financial power of attorney and a healthcare power of attorney, just so that everything is kind of all wrapped up together. Um, and um, the attorney usually checks to make sure that any deeds, um, your your properties are in in the uh, in the trust as well. So um, that's usually kind of how that goes. Um, there are small exceptions that some attorneys make, but usually our our malpractice insurance <laughs> requires that we are 
the um, responsible for everything. So if we take a, a portion of the trust and we amend it, so if we change the 25 to 35, legally, we are responsible for the entire underlying trust. And so that's why we say, like, I'm not taking responsibility for another attorney's work um, because then I'm on the hook if there's a problem in there. So that's kind of like the, the how how you kind of adjust things um, as they go. Um, I can't remember. There was something else that you wanted me to talk about. Um, I think you covered the two, like how to set one up. Uh, what, why to set one up? I think you covered that. And then how to revise one. So I think that covers okay. a lot of those, the base. Do you think there's anything else when it comes to like meeting people for the first time, Natasha, things you like to make sure you convey when, when explaining the, the power of a trust and what, what it can do. And then I'll, I'm going to, I'm going to, before I open it up for Q and A, I, I kind of wanted to make sure we covered all of those things. Yeah, I think the thing that that I am usually like people usually get really hung up on like what their assets are and um you know, oh well I only have a couple things so I don't know that I need like a whole trust. But that's not really how a trust works. A trust is the structure of what's happening. I don't care what your assets are, frankly. Um I just need to know that you have your assets in the trust. So once you have a trust, you can use it. You would open a new bank account in the name of the trust. You would buy a new property in the name of the trust. You would, um, you know, and once it's in the name of the trust, it's not going to change how you do anything. Your checks don't change. Um, you can still sell the property as easily as you could when it was just in, in your name, um, you know, anything like that. So I think that's the thing that, that people often say like, oh, my, it's super simple. I don't even own anything. But like, that doesn't matter. Like it doesn't, the, it's not asset driven. A trust is not asset driven at all. It is, it is, it is solely to get you out of this probate like whole. And so whatever you own, I want it in the trust, whether it's 25 bank accounts and 300 properties, or if it's one bank account and no properties, I don't care. I want it all in the trust in, in that way. And the other thing is to kind of touch on something else that usually comes up is life insurance and retirement. Um, so um, for life insurance, if you have minor children, so children who are under 18 years old, um, and you think, oh, I have life insurance, I'm going to make them the beneficiary of this life insurance policy. They cannot access it until they're 18 years old. Their guardians can petition the court to get it before they're 18, but nobody otherwise is going to get it till they're 18, unless you make the trust the beneficiary of that life insurance policy. And if you make the trust the beneficiary of the life insurance policy, then your children can have access to it and their guardians can have access to it then before they turn 18 so that they have actually ability to, um, to, to reach those assets. Um, retirement assets are totally different. So retirement assets are, um, you know, um, there's lots of of regulations involved in retirement assets. One of the really big things for me in checking, making sure that somebody is aware of what happens with retirement assets is making sure that if you are married, your spouse is the first beneficiary of any uh, retirement policies because spouses have privileges that no one else does. So that to me is super important. In terms of what happens after that, it's really a case-by-case -case basis that I would talk through with the client about what, who should be the second beneficiary. Sometimes you just do, um, you know, whoever it is that you'd like, whether it's children, if you've got two children, 50-50, if you have a cousin or a sibling or a parent or whatever, then usually you can just list them, um, you know, as is. But there are circumstances when you might want to do that a little bit differently, depending on certain circumstances. So those are the kind of other things that sort of come up regularly, I think, that I would want to make sure that people are aware of. Awesome. That's super helpful. Um, before I oh, turn it over to q and I'm going to kind of give, I'm going to use myself as an example because, you know, I think trusts and assets and when we talk about the things we own, it becomes like they're very personal, right? And so a lot of times people don't want to get too personal, but I'm going to get a little personal with you, Natasha, and I'm going to use myself kind of like as an example. And I know, I know almost everybody in this whole room, I know very well um uh or are, are definitely our past client um so uh this will help them kind of like know like where do, how much can i share right so when we go to the q a we're going to cut the recording then which means it's no longer going to be recorded this is more so that we have sort of the conversation between natasha and i together so natasha when i came to you i had a trust already in place from a previous attorney 
and you looked through the trust and I was very shocked to find that the trust had, well, I hadn't, I had opened more bank accounts since I had started the trust previously. I had owned a few more properties than I had then, but that's the only reason I came to you is please add these, um, please add these proper properties to my trust. Can you do that? Kind of similar to what you just said. And then um, I also, I then at, at the time had a little, I have a nephew now, right? And I mean, my life circumstance has circumstance. I was married when I had the previous trust and I was, I'm now divorced. So lots of life changes. Um, would you, what would you say when you, when you first heard me talk to you, you knew you were going to rewrite my whole trust. Would you say that was probably the, the thing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy answer. And then, but I needed some convincing because I felt like I was already protected. I was like, oh no, I have it all handled. It's fine. Yeah. How yeah. do you help me understand that it's like, you know, a little, you need to redo it. Yeah. Um, usually what it is, is actually life circumstance changes that are the biggest thing and the biggest reason why things change. And so yeah. um, I think Partly like marital status is huge. That's a big, big change. Um, I think the um, changing beneficiaries is, is that's big. Um, but also what I always look for in trusts is making sure that there are backup plans. Um, and so like, there's always an ideal circumstance and then there's the like, okay, let's say things don't go this way. And while I would love to think that I am your first call when somebody in your life passes away or something happens, I know I'm not. And so I need to make sure that you've got certain uh, kind of safeguards in place so that if you forget or don't want to, frankly, which I get, um, you know, call, then you have something there that is going to work. So, for example, we might come up with a circumstance where um, we are preparing for something that doesn't exist yet, right? A yeah. circumstance in which somebody, if somebody doesn't have kids and they decide that they want to plan for, you know, having kids, then, then we can do that. Um, and then we just need to make sure that we've got a solid backup plan in place. And then we have a backup plan to the backup plan. Um, yeah. So I am like... If you are looking to have a really lively, happy conversation, like I'm not, I'm not your call. I'm going to take you to some dark places. Um, but, but I think it's really important, and and I think that, and I feel really strongly that having that information and kind of thinking through those kind of worst case scenarios is really important because I, I, I never want somebody to go through all of this effort of doing this and creating a trust and thinking that they've got everything covered and everything handled, but then they forgot this one thing that they just didn't, you know, think through of like, you know, I don't know, there's any number of things that, that, you know, I would, I would ask about in those circumstances. So um, I think that's a lot of it. And, and actually that kind of parlays into why I think it's really important that somebody talk to an attorney rather than trying to handle these things on their own. Um, because attorneys, we, we think in, in ways <laughs> that are like really planning and really about like different scenarios that, I think normal people don't go to. And, um, you know, so so I think a lot of times I ask questions and the number of times that um, they are basic questions to me, but a client will say like, whoa, I never thought of that. Like, well, yeah, that's why you're talking to me. And that's kind of the whole point is that I am going to come up with these things and I'm going to make you think about things that you wouldn't have thought about if you were just trying to do this on your own. And that's where it becomes more important to speak to a professional who does this. So um, did I answer your question? Yeah, no, I think you did. So, and then I'm going to ask a couple others just, just for sake of kind of using myself as an example. And um, so... I, you, you and I may not have talked about this at length, but when my mother had passed away, um, she had a trust in place, but she had done what I considered to be like a, buy those NOLO books, um, those NOLO law books, N-O-L-O -O books, and then she would kind of fill in the blanks, and then she had it notarized, and that was her trust, and I had thankfully a pretty good, decent trust attorney. And he was able, because all, all the properties had moved into um, her home and then she had an investment property. So those two properties moved moved into the trust. And then the rest was an absolute um, circus. Um, everything was very difficult to parlay through and parse through. 
and the trust did not direct things because she had filled in the blanks, probably similar to like legal zoom. Um, what, because that's what she used at the time was now online. I, I would consider that. Um, have you ever had someone come to you with a very poorly written trust or the attorney has passed or the attorney is retired or they use the fill in the blank version and how do you help? Um, I redo the whole trust. Um, that's sort of the- What if the it person depends. has passed? Oh, the person has passed. You know, it depends. So in fact, you the two examples I gave before were both people who had done um, trusts that were just not great. And I think the best case scenario is that you've got assets listed somewhere as part of this trust. Um, and the worst case scenario is you've got nothing and then you're going through probate. And there's really not a lot you can do at that point in time. Um, I yeah. think one of, the, one of the things that that is kind of important is um, if you have an aging relative who has something have somebody look at it um, because most attorneys will take a look at these things and do complimentary consultations and just make sure that it is all corrected because in both of those trusts that I referred to earlier, one in which um, the there's only one child and you know everybody agrees, but she didn't put the house in the trust. And, and actually in that case, she had done a fill in the blanks and um, she, but she had moved. And so she hadn't put the, she didn't have the new house in the trust and she didn't know that she could buy the house in the trust. And so she had this like gaping hole in, in her trust. Some of her assets made it in, some of them did not. So the ones that didn't make it in are now going through probate. In the other circumstance where um, the other person did one, an online one, and, and you know listed their assets, listed the house, didn't list any other assets, but listed the house, then I was able to petition the court to get it into the trust so that it's distributed through the trust. And it was a considerably shorter process. So eight months instead of 18 months. Um, so that's that's a huge thing. And it saves the cost because then an attorney is gonna charge a flat fee for that. We don't have to use the statutory fees. When I talked about those fees for, for costs of how much it costs to go through probate, that's set by California. That's not set by an attorney. So we as attorneys don't have, don't really have a, a choice on how that fee is taken. Um, so that's not me saying that it's $23,000 for a million dollars of assets. That's set by the state of California. Um, so that's something. And, and in probates, actually, the other thing to know about that is that attorneys also don't get paid until the end. So that's that is that's worth noting that any attorney who puts in the time for a probate is putting it in without any no, knowledge of what they're getting until the very end. Well, knowledge, they might know what they're going to get, but they're not getting it until the very end. So, um, so it is, you know, there is, there is a risk involved for attorneys as well um, in, in taking on probates um, in, in that as well. Um, but so if somebody comes with me to, with a trust like that, then, then that's sort of where we're at. If they come to me before they pass away, then what I would do is look at what assets have been in the trust most of the time, it's none of them. Um, in like your mom's circumstance, I would have told her probably get everything into the trust. I'm going to keep the name of the trust, keep the date of the trust, and then let's just clean this up a little bit and make sure that not only that we fix the terms, but that you go to Citibank and you get your checking account into the name of the trust. Um, that if you know you're opening a new bank account, you open it in the name of the trust, um, just to like clean things up and make sure it all kind of uh, flows into the trust. Because you know if you're going to set one up, then let's make sure that you use it. So. All right. So the main question, last last question, then I'm going to open it up, and that is, what are trust costs, Natasha? And is it oh. are, like how how are they set? Because I find that um, attorneys kind of set them at different prices. Yeah. So. I would say that most attorneys in California do a flat fee structure for trusts. And usually, and I don't know, you know, I'm in a network of, of, of estate planning attorneys. So I, I know that all of us in this group, which is about a hundred attorneys, we all have flat fee structures for trusts that are include the trust, include a will, include the financial power of attorney, the healthcare power of attorney. And I think most of us include deeds in it. I know I include one deed. Um, and um, and so I would say that 
Um, there's a range in price, whether you are an individual or if you're a married couple, um, and that is going to, you know, change the calculus. Most fees that I have seen vary between around 2,500 to 3,500 um, for um, unmarried individuals. I feel like 3,000 is usually around the, the is probably around the, the median. Um, and then for married, married couples, it's usually between 35 and I've seen 35 to 50, I would say. So I would guess that the average would be around 42-ish um, would be like the median yeah. for that. So it's hard to say because, you know, there's different factors in terms of like which part of California you're in. You know, the Bay Area is going to be vastly different, could be vastly different than Los Angeles, could be vastly different than, you know, Santa Barbara or, um, you know, San Diego. So it just depends. Um, and different attorneys have different, um, you know, structures for various reasons. If somebody includes additional deeds or if they include the recording fees or don't include the recording fees or if they include notary. I'm a notary, so I do notary stuff myself, but a lot of attorneys are not notaries. And so they often have the client pay for that separately. So there's like little factors here and there that might change the, the pricing, but that's what I would say is like a general frame of reference. I don't know if yeah. that's helpful. No, it, I think it's very helpful because I think that a lot of folks don't know what to pay and I think you can google it and google will give you a, a range so I kind of wanted to hear where you see the range because you're yeah. in the, this is your profession so yeah with that said thank you so much Natasha we're going to transition I'm going to turn the recording off and uh I really appreciate you doing this um but now these I have more Q&A but we're, I'm going to do my Q&A with everybody else so I'm going to stop recording